Hi everyone, I'm Megan. I'm Stacy, And uh, welcome to the Survival Guide um, the, for the First Year Fellow, Fit for our Fellowship. Um, today we have a very exciting lecture for you all. So um, thank you guys for joining us live. I hope you guys know how much we really appreciate your participation and um, just supporting us here. So if you have missed any of the prior sessions, this is session five. You can find all of it posted uh, in two places. So if you Google California ACC and you um, California ACC fellows and training, it'll take you to the page and you can have all the videos up there. If you actually click on the videos, you'll be able to link to YouTube. So if you wanna just search YouTube for California ACC, if they have a channel and all the videos are there as well. So please feel free to go back and, and view as you please. And of course, for the upcoming sessions, they'll always be on Wednesdays. We'll always start at five o'clock. So de definitely join us if you can. Definitely join us for sure. And so we're gonna move straight into our uh, talk for today, um, given by Dr. Alicia Romero of Kaiser San Francisco. Dr. Romero received her medical degree from University of Texas School of Medicine, and then completed her internal medicine residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She then went on to a cardiovascular fellowship at Emory University, and then an interventional cardiology fellowship at Brown, and then a vascular medicine one at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. And she's uh, board certified in both cardiology and interventional cardiology, and she works at Kaiser San Francisco. And we look very much uh, forward to her talk on uh, acute coronary syndrome. So without further ado, let's move in um, to it. Um, as you may recall from our prior sessions, uh, we do have a Q&A um, at the end of the talk itself. Um, so if you could please uh, make sure that your mics are muted throughout the course of uh, this presentation. And if you have any questions, please feel free to place them in the chat box and we will collect them and um, we will ask them at the end of our uh, presentation. So let's move on to uh, presentation. And let us know if you can't hear anything or if there's any technical issues, okay? Hello, and I'm an interventional cardiologist at the San Francisco Medical Center, Kaiser Permanente, and I've been asked to speak to you today about acute coronary syndrome. I've been asked to give you some pearls so that you all can make it through your first few months as a new fellow. So I will do my best to, to give you some practical information as well as a little bit more detailed information and hopefully you will find this useful. So, uh, as I mentioned, we will focus on acute coronary syndrome and we'll look briefly at the pathophysiology. We'll also talk a bit about how to risk stratify patients to determine who may need to go sooner or who may need to pursue an invasive strategy, as well as review initial management. We'll spend some time talking about antiplatelet therapies and also a few of the landmark trials that support their use. So quickly, when we use the term acute coronary syndrome, we're really talking about a spectrum of disease that can begin with something like unstable angina, all the way to a, a complete occlusion of the coronary artery, which we call ST elevation MI. And this can result in various changes on the EKG. So today we're really going to focus on what we call the unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI. So for non-ST elevation MIs um, or acute coronary syndrome, we really have seen this in sort of an older population. So the median age is 68, and it tends to predominate more in men than women. In the US, we see about 780,000 cases annually. And when you're looking at the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome, there are certainly more non-ST elevation MIs than ST elevation MIs. And you'll learn that the non-ST elevation MI patient typically will have many more comorbidities than those presenting with them. There is a formal definition of MI, um, and we've divided them into various types, type 1 through type 5. Type 1 is what I think most of us think about when we think about an MI. It's related to atherosclerotic disease and uh, abrupt closure of the vessels. Um, 
Type 2 MI is what we often call demand ischemia and can be caused by multiple different pathophysiologies, which we'll discuss briefly. Um, and then the other MIs are more related to procedures such as PCI or cabbage. So as you mentioned, type 1 MI, we're really talking about atherosclerosis or coronary thrombosis. And the type 2 MI, which we often label as demand ischemia, has actually multiple different etiologies, which includes uh, coronary vasospasm, spasm, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which we often use the acronym SCAD, uh, stress cardiomyopathy, and then you can read the others there. So let's focus in on the type 1 MI and talk a little bit about the pathology. So at the top, you will see uh, a normal coronary artery. And there are essentially three very common pathologies that involve uh, plaque rupture. So the most common etiology for coronary artery thrombosis derived, is derived from the thin cap fibroacroma, which is pictured here in letter E. And essentially, this is a deposition of lipids in the wall of the coronary artery, which then becomes sort of a necrotic core due to macrophages. And then once this thin cap fibroacroma spontaneously cracks open, for lack of a better word, um, it really acts as a thrombogenic source. And you can see in the picture F, this is depicting a black rupture where you see the necrotic core at the D. And then you see, you know, a thrombus forming in the lumen. So, um, and this is sort of a blown up picture underneath so that you can see the necrotic core is exposed to the blood and it is a procoagulant, therefore causing thrombosis. The other two etiologies are a little less common, uh, black erosion, which is more of a denudation of the endothelial uh, lining of the coronary artery. And so it's almost, you can think of it almost like a wrong spot on the coronary artery, which allows uh, a thrombosis to form. And we're learning this is more common in women. Uh, and we're also um, learning that it's actually more common overall than we initially thought. Um, the third less common etiology is calcified nodule, um, which is shown here. So just to show you in, in another way, um, another manner, you can see here there's an angiogram of a, a coronary artery showing the lesion. And what is depicted here is a, what we call OCT. And this is a way to visualize the inside of the coronary artery to understand the pathophysiology. And this is just demonstrating the thin cap fibroacroma and plaque rupture. So what you're seeing is this is the lumen of the coronary artery, and the arrows are pointing to the thin cap fibroacroma, which has ruptured, as you can see, and the star is showing you that necrotic core. And this is just another image of the coronary erosion that we spoke of, which looks quite different. And you can see you have a normal part of the coronary artery, followed by this sort of denuded section of the endothelium and some thrombus on top. And then lastly, it was just showing you what a calcified nodule would look like on OCT. So now we're just going to take a pretty typical case of a 53-year-old gentleman who has hypertension and he presents with new onset of intermittent chest pain. He's had some pain between the scapula the day prior and he continued to have recurrent chest pain today after working out, so he decided to become and get evaluated in the emergency room. So you can see here his vital signs are reasonable. He is examined, he looks well, nothing obvious on exam, and you can see his relevant labs, which show creatinine of 1.2, a reasonable hemoglobin, and an elevated troponin. Here's his EKG, um, which is showing you some um, changes in the inferior leads to green AVF. You can see some T wave inversions and some maybe some subtle ST elevation, but not meeting criteria for ST elevation MI. And also in the lateral leads, you can see some T wave inversions as well. So the question is at the at the current time he's chest pain free and he looks well. So what shall we do for this gentleman? Well I think most of you are already familiar with the initial management, which includes making sure the patient is pain-free, and if they're not, you can try medications such as nitroglycerin or morphine. You can 
think about supplemental oxygen if they're actually hypoxic, so an O2 set of less than 90%. And then you're going to start thinking about what other medical therapy you can give them. So, of course, you're going to give an antiplatelet, and I think all of us know that an aspirin, a baby aspirin, is a good way to start her through 25 milligrams. And then you will consider beginning a beta blocker within the first 24 hours if there's no obvious contraindication. So that would be any signs of heart failure or hypotension. If those are not present, it's very reasonable to begin an oral beta blocker. We tend to avoid the intravenous beta blockers because they may have some adverse uh, effects, if, particularly if the patient is in heart failure or has a depressed rejection fraction. You can also start a statin. And the next determination will be what other antiplatelet or anticoagulant do you want to to get or should you get? And that becomes a little bit more of a conversation, which I will get into next. After after we've determined the medical therapy that we think is reasonable, then the next concept is do we decide to pursue an invasive strategy? And we will talk about how to make those decisions. And then lastly, at the end of the course, the hospital course, you'll want to consider some other therapies before sending the patient home. So one way to help sort of decide how sick is the patient is to use some risk assessment tools. There are many. Here I've listed three that have been very well validated. And these tools are, are very useful to help you try to understand whether this patient needs to go urgently to the cath lab, what, whether or not you might want to consider adding an anticoagulant. And these have all been very well validated to predict death and recurrent MI at various time periods. So uh, the TB risk score is something that you can probably remember pretty readily. And essentially, it's just tallying points for each risk factor or other um, present or other symptoms present in presentation. So you can see there you get a point for age, having a new history of coronary disease, um, having multiple risk factors, and whether or not you're having ongoing pain, uh, positive cardiac markers, and EKG changes. So the, the point of this is not to really go over all of the points, but is to understand the concept that the more points you get, the higher risk patient you have. So once you start to reach the intermediate stage, that will be a time where you may want to consider adding an anticoagulant or even the timing of an invasive therapy. Um, there is also something called the TME risk index, which is another sort of quick way to assess the patient and only requires that you know the age, heart rate, and systolic blood pressure. And this is just showing you that as the index rises, as you can imagine, the in-hospital mortality increases. And down at uh, the bottom graph is simply showing how we can use the TME risk index in patients who have non-ST elevation MI, which is in the white box, versus those coming in with ST elevation MI, those who've been reperfused, and those who have not. So another quick way to get a sense of how sick the patient is. Um, the GRACE model is similar design. It's a little bit more involved. It here has listed all the points, uh, all the key indicators, and what the points will be for each item. And again, it's a matter of adding up the points. And once you've added up the total points, you will then get a probability of in-hospital death. This looks very tedious, but actually there is an app for that. So I put in the information for our patient here, which I gave his age, heart rate, blood pressure, whether or not he was in heart failure, and some other items you can see here. And that gave me a sense of his risk, right? So his in-hospital death was very low, um, six month, one year, and three years. So overall, he's not high risk, um, and that kind of helps us assess what to do. So the last one is called the perceived risk model. And again, this is something you can get an app to help you calculate, but just so you can see, you, you can see it's a recurring theme. People want to know about the age, the gender, what their vital signs are, what their EKG is doing, and whether they have positive biomarkers. And all these things, again, on this graph, based on the score, you will see what the 30-day mortality is, or even what the 30-day mortality or the risk of another MI is. So the next step, after you sort of assess the risk and you kind of have a sense of which direction you want to go, we still have to finish dealing with the antiplatelet therapy. So everyone gets an aspirin. that's pretty straightforward. The next question is, what other antiplatelet therapies are there? Well, we have the oral P2Y12 inhibitors. 
And then we have an intravenous drugs called the like protein 2 b 3 receptor inhibitors. These are less common than they used to be, but we will talk about them very briefly. Uh, this again is to remind you of our friend, the platelet, and to remind you that there are many ways to interact with platelets. So, of course, we've talked about aspirin. Now we're going to focus on uh, the P2I12 inhibitor here. And then lastly, we'll review the 2B3A receptor inhibitors. So, clopidogrel is our oldest P2I12 drug. And um, it is a prodrug, which means that it must be converted to its active form um, via cytochrome P450. It is also um, has a loading dose of 300 to 600 milligrams depending on the situation. So generally speaking, if you need rapid onset platelet activation, for example, you've just implanted a stent, you're going to choose the 600 milligram dose. If you're planning to do a procedure later, say longer than six hours, you can get the 300 milligram dose, and then you do a daily dose of 75 milligrams. You should be aware with all the P2I12s that you must discontinue them for at least five days before any major surgery. Um, and um, generally speaking, we recommend the P2I12s be continued for a year after any MI. And that has more to do with the clinical scenario than the type of cement. So the data behind clopidogrel comes from a trial called the CURE trial. Um, and this was a, a very large trial that was looking at uh, 12,000 patients who were coming in with acute coronary syndrome. It was a combination of both non-ST elevation MI and ST elevation MI. And what they were trying to understand is whether or not there was any benefit to adding clopidogrel along with aspirin in terms of reducing heart attack, stroke, and death. And in fact, they found that there was, as you can see here. There was about a 20% relative risk reduction in the group who got both aspirin and clopidogrel. And for this reason, clopidogrel is now a class one recommendation for patients who have ACS along with aspirin. But down the road came prasugrel, a slightly newer P2I12. This also is a prodrug, so it does require conversion, but it does have a more rapid and consistent platelet inhibition than does clopidogrel. There are some uh, specific caveats with prasugrel. One is that it is contraindicated in patients who've had a TIA. It is also not really recommended in elderly patients or in patients with a low body weight. It is also something you may not use a lot as a first-year fellow seeing patients in the emergency room because it really should only be given after the coronary anatomy is known and that there is a definite plan to, to pursue PCI. Um, and you can see the loading dose there. So Prasivril, uh, the data for Prasivril comes from two main trials, Triton T38, which was again another very large trial looking again at this population of acute coronary syndrome patients. And in this case, they took half the group and put them on aspirin plus clopidogrel, and they took the other group and put them on aspirin and prasugrel. And again, looking at the same end point, which was death, heart attack, and stroke together, and they found that prasugrel did in fact outperform clopidogrel. Uh, so less events in the group that have prasugrel. However, this did come with a bit of a price and that was bleeding. So you can see that in terms of all major bleeding, there was more in the prasugrel group. And when you dug a bit deeper, it turned out that there were more fatal uh, and bleeding as well as intracranial hemorrhage. And the intracranial hemorrhage really turned out to be more significant in those patients who had had a prior TIA. And this is why it is not recommended in patients who've had a TIA. The other group that I don't have on here, there were two other groups that they noticed didn't really derive any benefit, but all they got was bleeding. And that would have been the group that weighed less than 60 kilograms, so the low body weight patients, and the patients older than 75. So in the first trial, the Triton TIMI38, um, all those patients uh, had a plan to go to the cath lab and have a stent placed. So that is where the indication comes to use prasugrel with stenting. In, the, in another trial called Trilogy ACS, the intention here was to manage patients medically more conservatively. So they were not going to go to the cath lab necessarily and get a stent. 
And in this group, it turns out that there actually was not a significant difference between taking clopidogrel or taking prasugrel. And this is why currently there is not an indication to give prasugrel if you are not planning to go have a stent. Lastly, Ticagrelor, our newest P2I12, has the benefit that it does not require any conversion. Um, it's faster uh, in terms of uh, platelet recovery. Um, however, it does have some interesting side effects, such as dyspnea, which can happen in up to 15% of patients, and also bradycardia. It also is recommended that you keep the aspirin dose low, less than 100 milligrams, because if you have a higher dose, it may affect, uh, it may decrease its effectiveness on the platelet. And you can see the loading dose there is 100 milligrams. And this drug is actually twice a day, uh, different than clopidogrel, which is once a day. So the data behind Dicagrelor uh, is from the Plato trial. And again, very similar, where we had a large group of patients with acute coronary syndrome coming in. And again, half the group received clopidogrel, the other half ticagrelor. And here, there was a, a benefit with ticagrelor over clopidogrel. So again, they were looking at death, heart attack, stroke, and the ticagrelor group had less of those uh, as compared to the clopidogrel. Now, there was more bleeding in the ticagrelor but there was, it was mainly non-procedure related bleeding and uh, no, not necessarily increase in fatal bleeding. So based on all of this, if we were to try to summarize, um, it would, any of the P2Y12s that we discussed, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor are very, are class one recommendations, meaning they should be given in the acute coronary syndrome patients um, however, there is a slight preference for ticagrelor over clopidogrel in patients, um, and there is um, a specific indication with prasugrel that is only in patients who are really going to get stiff. So I tried to summarize at the bottom to help you out. So if you're following the data, clopidogrel is sort of the older P2Y12 um, that may not have the most robust data if, if you wanted to follow the book. But a lot of times you'll find based on your institution, it's a bit of a practical issue. So if you're following the data, you might say Ticagrelor would be the P2I12 you'd reach for for a patient coming in with an ACS and you haven't decided whether you're taking them to the cath lab. Um, the downside could be that it is a twice a day drug. So there may be some concerns about compliance, and there may be some concerns about bleeding, um, but it would be the preferred uh, drug for the ACS population. Clopidogrel is also acceptable. Um, it is also a good choice for patients coming in as an outpatient with stable coronary disease undergoing PCI. Clopidogrel is also better when you have a patient who's on a DOAC or warfarin because it has the least bleeding of all the P2Y12s. Um, and of course, you could use clopidogrel if, for example, a patient has a, a contraindication to the other two. So that might be for prasugrel, low body weight, age greater than 75, or for ticagrelor, it could be that they couldn't tolerate it from dyspnea, or perhaps they just have a high risk of bleeding and you want to select a P2Y12 that has slightly less bleeding. Now, moving on to the 2B3As, um, I will speak very briefly about these because really they are sort of relegated to the cath lab. It's, it's not particularly common that we would give them um, a fret, although sometimes that can happen if a patient is really having a lot of pain despite being on an aspirin and a P2I12. So as I said, it's really mainly uh, used in the cath lab. But I, I'm only really going to speak about one, um, eptifibrotide, which is also known as a tegron. And it's just so you're aware, um, it has a half-life of about two to three hours. It can cause thrombocytopenia, so you will need to monitor the CDC while on this drug. Um, and if a patient has real insufficiency, you will have to adjust the doses. Sometimes if they're very severe real insufficiency, you will avoid this altogether. <clears throat> 
But some examples of when we might use this would be if we had um, a lot of thrombotic burden when we do the angiography and we want to help sort of clear the thrombus out, we might start it for that. Or if we have a complication, um, we may, uh, you know, we'll, there's thrombus forming, we may use it in that scenario. And generally we'll run it for a period of time after the procedure. So moving on to anticoagulant therapy, and there are quite a few choices uh, for an anticoagulant. So of course we have our unfractionated heparin, we have our low molecular weight heparin, bivalrudin, and then some others that are maybe not as commonly used, bondaparinox and arcatrivan. So for the heparins, we just sort of group them here. Um, I think most of you are very familiar with unfractionated heparin. It has a lot of pros. Um, that are listed there, you know, you can use it on pretty much any patient. You don't have to worry about their kidney function. It's short acting, you can turn it off, it's reversible. Um, the low molecular weight heparin's pros that it's much easier to use, it's subcutaneous delivery, you don't have to monitor a bunch of things. Um, and I'll talk about more like from a practical standpoint, which one is commonly used for patients going to the cath lab. So, uh, but I just want to briefly touch on the others. So Fonda Paranox, I think is probably pretty rarely used, but just so that you're aware is actually perfectly acceptable to use in a patient who has ACS. Um, the main reason I think most people don't use it is that it's not something A, we're that familiar with, and B, um, if the patient is actually going to go to the cath lab and have an intervention, it gets a little tricky because uh, they're going to need a completely different anticoagulant for the cath lab to have a safe intervention done. Um, so I think for that reason, it's sort of avoided, um, but it is it could be a reasonable choice for, say, an elderly patient with normal kidneys who you never really plan to do anything invasive with because it's subcutaneous and you don't have to monitor anything. So bivalrudin is often used in the cath lab more than it is outside, but it is an option to be given up front. Um, and its half-life is short, and it's a good option for patients who have hit or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It is quite expensive, um, much more expensive than heparin. So practically speaking, probably best reserved for the cath lab or a patient with hit. And argatrogram briefly is another uh, direct thrombin inhibitor that you can use um, for HIT. So if we're gonna summarize based on the guidelines, what are the options uh, for anticoagulant and ACS? You can, they're all the ones we've discussed. I highlighted there at the bottom that I think uh, from a practical standpoint, unfractionated heparin is probably the safest way to go because it gives you many options. If you use low molecular weight heparin, it might delay the procedure. Um, there are places that feel comfortable proceeding with uh, percutaneous coronary intervention with anoxaparin. There is a conversion and additional intravenous anoxaparin you have to give in order to perform a safe stent procedure. So um, I think most labs use the unfractionated heparin up front, and then they can choose whatever anticoagulant in the lab that, that the operator likes. So I think that might be a good way to go unless you, your institution might be slightly different. Um, so that's a, a summary sort of of the antiplatelets and anticoagulants. And the last piece is really just talking about which patients should go to the cath lab. And, and if they do go to the cath lab, how soon should they go to the cath lab? So we sort of divide that into ischemia guided versus invasive strategy. And by ischemia guided, this, this is the idea that you are going to take a more conservative approach. And this would be appropriate for patients with the low risk score that we discussed, the grace and the titty. Or it might be even that the patient or family, for whatever reason, does not want to pursue an aggressive approach or an invasive approach, and they just make the decision not to, not to proceed. It could be certain characteristics about the patient, even if they're maybe high risk, perhaps they have multiple comorbidities that make them unsuitable for an uh, angiography and PCI. So um, when we talk about invasive strategy, obviously we're talking about going to the cath lab and evaluating their coronary anatomy. And so obviously this is gonna be for the higher risk patients. And we do talk about 
sort of intermediate, early invasive, and delayed invasive. And I don't want to get too caught up in, in the exact timing, but I think it's important to have a sense of who should probably go very soon and who could maybe go in a day or two. So when you're thinking about who should I be taking to the cath lab very soon, obviously ST elevation and I, which is beyond the scope of our talk today, are people that we go rapidly. And the next level is going to be our non-ST elevation MIs who are either having ongoing pain despite being on an anticoagulant and an antiplatelet and even giving nitroglycerin and narcotics and they're still having pain. That's a person that should go soon. If they're unstable hemodynamically, if they're having ventricular arrhythmias, or if they're even having signs of heart failure, those are all people who should be addressed relatively soon. Anyone short of that, who you still plan to take to the lab because they have positive enzymes or maybe some EKG changes, should probably go within the next day or so. I kind of like to break it into that. So it's kind of important just to identify those very high risk patients so that you can get them their treatment as soon as possible. Um, and then just a quick word on um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs and, and um, aldosterone antagonists, because I think sometimes this gets forgotten on the back end. So of course we're talking about the initial management, initial strategies, but once we've gotten through all that, the patient has recovered and they're ready to leave, um, it's important to remember that we need to know their other, think about their other risk factors, think about what their ejection fraction is after this event. And so in patients with an EF less than 40, or if they have hypertension or diabetes, you really should consider adding on an ACE inhibitor. Um, and of course, if they can tolerate that, uh, an, an ARB would be obviously uh, warranted. And then I think a lot of people sort of forget about um, Dactone. Um, and this, again, is really recommended in, in patients um, who have normal kidneys and also have a depressed EF, diabetes, or had heart failure during their admission. So don't forget about that. So in summary, um, this is sort of just a quick little guide, a pocket guide, if you will, for when you see your ACS patients. You're going to want to, of course, give your aspirin, consider an oral beta blocker if they're hemodynamically stable, not in heart failure. And then you're going to want to make your selection of your P2I12. I didn't mention this, but there may be times where you don't give a P2I12. And this is a little more nuanced. But if you're following the guidelines, really every patient who comes in with ACS should have a P2I12. Some of the reasons you may not do it would be if you have a very high suspicion that the patient is going to have multivessel coronary disease. And um, this is a hard thing to know. It's not like you have a crystal ball, but um, occasionally you will give the load of the P2I12, you will go to angiography, you will see that the patient has multivessel coronary disease, and now you're a bit stuck because they cannot undergo bypass for at least five days, at least in most institutions. Um, many surgeons, you know, really don't want to take the bleeding risk. So there is that to deal with, but I would say if we're following guidelines, they really should all get a P2I12 up front. Um, your next decision then is going to be whether or not to add an IV anticoagulant. And in this case, in general, I recommend a fractionated heparin. And again, the decision there is going to be based on your sort of risk score. So the intermediate and higher risk should probably start getting an IV anticoagulant as well. And then from this, you're going to sort of branch off into whether you think they're low risk. So you're going to take maybe an ischemia guided therapy. And this is going to be, like I said, patients who have negative troponin, no EKG changes, very low risk for you may just decide to manage them medically versus those, as we discussed earlier, who are having high risk for EKG changes, ongoing pain. Those are the patients you're going to take to the lab. Of course, if you elect the ischemia guided therapy, but then later in the hospitalization, they develop either recurrent chest pain or heart failure arrhythmias, obviously you're going to change your strategy and um, move forward with coronary angiography. And in those patients that you do choose a conservative strategy, you may elect to do some sort of risk stratification before they leave. Maybe an echo, uh, if that's abnormal, you would then probably lead yourself to coronary angiography or perhaps a stress test that if it is abnormal, once again, coronary angiography. So um, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, good luck on your first few months and uh, thank you for your attention.
time for a, a fantastic lecture by Dr. Romero. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and then we're going to go back to Virgo um, we before we go into the Q&A. Um, we have Dr. Romero here with us as well, which is fantastic. Um, and she is um, ready to answer any questions uh, that we have uh, gathered in the uh, chat box as well. Um, so there have been a couple that trickled in. Dr. Romero, if you're ready. Oh, sure. I just, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I have to say that's a very bizarre experience listening to yourself talk for 40 <laughs> minutes. It's a bit painful, I must say, but anyway, I hope it was uh, educational at least. So I can't see the questions, but go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, they've been uh, sent to us uh, via the secure chat or the, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So uh, the first question that we had is that you um, wonderfully explained um, the, um, the uh, Timmy score versus the Timmy index score. And you, um, the question was wondering whether you can explain this a little bit further. Um, in regards to the difference between the two and when you might use it? I mean, I guess from a practical standpoint, it, the Timmy risk score, which was the first one I showed you where you kind of add up the points, would probably be the most useful tool on the go. Um, and, and that was really what I think I would have you focus on for when you're doing a rapid assessment of a patient, because that will give you sort of this sense of whether they're low, medium, or high risk, and, and really kind of use that as a decision to, to um, increase the aggressive therapy. Is that too general of an answer? Or is that okay? <laughs> yeah. I think that, that's fantastic. Thank okay. you. I think you ended up addressing a lot of the questions actually as your talk went on. Um, there was initially a question of if you could summarize which P2Y12 inhibitor to reach for, but I think you ended up in one of your yeah. slides actually very uh, succinctly um, coming, uh, doing that. And then actually another question was, uh, would you consider not using clopidogrel on someone with multivessel who you suspect might have multivessel disease in case of cabbage? And I think you actually also touched upon that. Yeah. Um, I think for the first year fellow, maybe how, what are the, what are the ways in which you might suspect someone to have multivessel disease? How can you tell with the patient that just kind of comes in? What are the things you might, yeah. might I, that? I was <laughs> like, I wish I could really give you, how about this? I'll tell you a converse. Someone who you could feel really comfortable clavix loading or ticagrelor loading is someone who's had a cabbage already because the likelihood of them having another cabbage in this era is very, very low. So I like go crazy on those, on those patients. But uh, I think, yeah, it is, honestly, it's, it's really hard, but I would say like probably, you know, a, a diabetic with is, is up there with, you know, multiple comorbidities, someone who you think would actually be a surgical candidate. So if you're, if you're seeing, again, I'm giving you the converse. So if you're seeing an elderly patient with CKD and end-stage renal disease, you know, they're not really going to be a surgical candidate, right? So you're feeling safe to, to go ahead and load them. And in some institutions, see, it's really hard to give this talk because I know it's very different in different hospitals, but in some institutions, you know, the, the angiogram may happen. Literally, they walk in the ED and like an hour later, they're getting their cast. So the point is a bit more, not as important in that patient. But in the patient who's going to hang out for a couple of days, you would want to really think about the P2Y12. So, and, and the clopidogrel, you know, I can just say in our institution, you know, I'm giving this talk, but honestly, we use clopidogrel much more than we do ticagrelor. And it's just kind of more for practical reasons, cost and compliance and that kind of thing. On your exam, choose Ticagrelor. Interesting. Do you, uh, this is kind of just a question for me, but uh, you say that it's better tolerated. Do you find that a lot of patients develop dyspnea and shortness of breath with the Ticagrelor? Is that why it ends up maybe not getting used other than- No, I, yeah, no, I think it's more probably, so it's about like maybe a 10% incidence of dyspnea. And honestly, that tends to go away if the patient was willing to just continue it. But uh, I think for some places, it's inertia or lack thereof um, of change in, in some ways, to be honest with you. I think a lot of us are just very comfortable with clopidogrel. It's got good data. Not to say clopidogrel is not a good p 2 12 All of them have good data behind them, but there's just this sort of slight. Um, and I didn't want to confuse matters, but actually there's been more data that's come out more recently that kind of conflicts what I just told you. But the guidelines are, are still using the data that 
that we had about, about ticagrelor being superior. So for now, ticagrelor is a 2A indication in terms of being preferred over, over clopidogrel. I didn't want to confuse you. So we'll just stick with the guidelines. That's the best way to go. <laughs> Sounds good, especially for the, you know, the tests and the, the boards and whatnot. Yes. Yeah. Stick yeah. with the guidelines for sure. Fantastic. Well, our next question um, uh, asks uh, if you could comment on newer data regarding shorter duration of DAPT therapy post PCI, which yeah. patients we could consider this in. Yeah. So um, for that, well, so currently we sort of divide we sort of discuss the duration of DAPT. Really these days, it's more based on the clinical presentation. It used to be about, oh, it's a medicated stent and we're worried about stent thrombosis. And so everyone is gonna get DAPT for one year. But that has evolved over time. So the current guidelines, the current DAPT guidelines would recommend that any patient who presents with ACS, whether that be non-STEMI, STEMI, should, and again, regardless of a stent, should get um, DAPT for 12 months. If it's a stable coronary artery disease patient coming from home with an abnormal stress test, that's six months. Um, now, there are stents that have a designation for 28 days of DAP, and that is really for high-risk bleeders. So the Zion stent is one of them. Um, and so I would not feel comfortable just putting the stent in and then telling someone you only need 28 days. But I would feel comfortable if, God forbid, they had a GI bleed or something and I had to stop it, that they have completed 28 days. And, and there is data to support that that's safe. Um, there's a question on double versus triple therapy. Yes. No. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, traditionally, people have done one month of triple therapy. By that, I'm talking about warfarin, aspirin, 81 milligrams, and a P2I12. But there is more data coming out to support skipping that step and going directly to um, P2I12 plus your anticoagulant. Um, and I think, again, a lot of this depends on weighing the risk of an ischemic event or, or subacute stent thrombosis with the bleeding risk of the patient. So there are, like I said, there's an app for that. There's calculators that help you sort of determine the patient's bleeding risk, like has blood score. And then there's calculators that help you determine what their ischemic risk is. And so you sort of weigh those two. Um, That's fantastic, fantastic. Um, another question that we have um, in the chat is, um, what about bedside echo for correlating EKG findings with wall motion abnormalities and ejection fraction function? Mimickers of AMI, such as uh, pericarditis, myocarditis, but on the other hand, you also do not want to delay care. Yeah, no, I mean, I love that. I, our fellows are great at doing that. They do that a lot, especially when it's a little bit unclear what's going on. Um, incredibly helpful. Yes. Uh, I think this is a, I like this question a lot. Um, what is considered a high trope? You know, how high does the trope need to go before you're like, oh, you know, let me uh, not wait till the next, you know, let me not wait for another six hours. Let's go now. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, you know, I think, I, I hope that I painted more of a picture in which the troponin is really sort of the least important number in my mind. I mean, you can have somebody, you know, having stuttering chest pain with like a 99% circumflex and their troponin is 0.5, right? That doesn't make me feel better that their troponin is low. It's more about the clinical presentation. You know, is this person stuttering pain, dynamic EKG changes, um, heart failure, you know, those kind of things. It's the clinical signs is what's going to drive you to the cath lab, not a number. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, another question we got, um, we're all kind of, I don't wanna say spoiled, but we're privileged to work in um, uh, centers that have calf uh, abilities or ability to calf patients. Um, but what happens, and this can sometimes happen if we're out in the, um, in the uh, more rural areas, we get a patient who um, is at a non-calf uh, center and they get given lytics, when do we consider giving lytics? What do we do with patients? You know, when they come over to us to a cath uh, facility, um, yeah, 
Yeah, I know. I'd have to dust off the old books to remember the dose of lytics myself. Um, mm -hmm. I have not given them in years. But yeah, so lytics still have a role, and you've pointed out exactly where the role is um, in a rural area. But basically, you're looking for resolution of the ST segment by greater than 50%, and also pain. So, I mean, everyone may have a different answer for this, but generally, our practice would be, and we don't get this often, but it would be that if someone was reperfused as evidenced by the two points that I just mentioned, we would not necessarily rush them to the cath lab because they have a slightly increased risk of bleeding. Even though most of us do radial procedures, they're still, I mean, they just got lytics, right? So you, you are not eager to take them, but if they fail to reperfuse, still having pain, still having ST, then sure, we'll take them right away to the lab. But at some point, they should have an invasive angiogram. So probably like the next day would be a, a reasonable time frame. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I think we might have time for one more question. And so I see one in the chat box, switching from ticagrelor to clopidogrel in someone who's post PCI, um, do you wait 12 hours, do you wait 24 hours? Um, you do need to reload, I'll say that, but I'll, I'll let you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, there's a nice, I don't know this off the top of my head, but there is a very nice diagram um, in the AC, if you go to acc.org and you look under the guidelines section, there's a whole like update on DAP. And what's really nice there is there's a lovely graph that shows you exactly how to do the conversions from one P2I12 to another. And I'm sorry, I don't have that like in my mind at the moment, but that's a good resource um, for you for that if you need to convert. And it's usually, I think, you know, the common ones, I feel like we typically would call not 24, but yes, we definitely go by the, the chart as well. Yeah. We, we don't do a lot of the switching, to be honest with you, but it's certainly possible to do, yeah. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Romero, for an oh, excellent and an excellent q and I definitely think this was very educational and very practical as well, too, uh, you know, being a fellow and uh, beyond beyond that as well. So, yeah. Exactly. Thank you so oh. much. Yeah, my pleasure. Good luck to you all. <laughs> thank you. you. And thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, as you as you know, um, these are recorded, like Stacey was saying, mm -hmm. on the ACC website. So if you want to you know, peruse this at a later date, feel free to uh, take a look at it there. Next week, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Dr. Singh, and he's from UC Davis, and he's actually going to cover uh, STEMI complications. So I think um, definitely a good segue from this talk, ACS moving on to, to STEMI complications. So tune in if you can next week, five o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.